Call of Order. Uh, welcome everybody to the March 9th edition of the Mount Failure Planning Commission. First order of business is to approve the agenda. Uh, there will be no minutes on five. I'm trying to figure out why the minutes are missing. So, okay. But I checked the online and we don't have them. Okay, so we will strike number five. Any uh, opposition to approval of the minutes with the omission of number five? No. Nope. Passed by unanimous consent. Next is comments from the chair. I have none. Fourth is general business. Comments from the public. There is no members of the public here. So we will move past that. Which brings us straight to number six. Answer any questions on the final strikeout copies and draft map of the design review district for a uh, public hearing on, uh, on the Planning Commission hearing on March 23rd. And we have... So I didn't expect that we would have a lot of discussion about this. I mostly just wanted to make it available and see if people had questions. Predominantly, um, what Meredith and I did was uh, we, we went through a final proofread of things and found a couple of inconsistencies. So it looks like there's a lot of changes, but there really is very little change of intent or content. And the, some of the primary changes we had were we had an inconsistency on up front. It said, if you are making in-kind repairs, then you are exempt from design review. And then later on, it would talk about evaluating standards for these types of repairs. And so we had a question of whether those should be um, exempt or not. And what we decided working uh, was just to go and take them out of the exemptions and make them administrative permits. And so really, we really can't evaluate whether or not something meets it once it's exempt. So the easier thing to do is to go through and say, if you're going to, and then we also had a question. So you want to replace these windows. And you're going to replace them in kind. In other words, I'm going to replace them with wooden windows. Um, is that you know, that, that automatically becomes an exempt activity. So as long as you're replacing with wooden windows, and the question is, is that what we want? Is that what we're expecting? Um, if you have wooden clabberts on the side of your house and you want to take those wooden clabberts off and replace them with wooden clabberts, you're losing architectural integrity or historic materials, but you're, you are replacing them in kind. So those were the questions that Meredith and I were kind of kicking around was, okay, should this be exempt? Should this not be exempt? And what we said was, if you're going to take things out and replace them in kind, for example, an old window, then it, it will be an administrative permit, but that can be, you know, that can be approved. It doesn't have to go to hearing. So as long as you replace a window, you know, maybe it's a historic window, as long as it's replaced in kind, in other words, with another wooden window, and but because it's administrative, we can go through and make sure it's got the proper. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, make yeah. sure it's got the proper light divisions. That's a two and, over one. So, in relationship we can, to of the amount relationship, of glass how to the frame. far yeah. is it in, set in or set out from the building frame? We can go through and make those evaluations because it's an administrative permit. Okay. So the advantage of that is, a lot of times if you can make make the things you want to have happen make them easy for people, developers are more likely to choose the easy route. So if we go through and say, hey, if you do that in kind, we will review it and it can be an administrative permit. If you want to replace that with a fiberglass or a composite window, you've got to go to the DRC. And then they can decide whether or not. But if you're replacing things in kind, then we can do it. And so that was the idea was, and we, so it really didn't change the intent. We think that was the intent all along, but by kind of taking it out of the exempt pile, because it was talked about in the exempt pile as exempt, and then talked about with regulations later on, we kind of had to fix that inconsistency. And that's how we fixed it, was to go through and move it to an administrative permit rather than an exemption. Right. Mike, if it started out, if it was originally a single glazed window, 
and you wanted to replace it with a double glazed, would you still consider that in kind? We were going to be considering that as in kind. Okay, all right. I'm just curious because, yeah, you'd hate for them to have to go to the DRB even though in some yeah, ways to, because yeah. they're we're putting already... in one extra layer of glass. Um, but it looks like the same window. Yeah. yeah, but we went through a number of those um, little things. There are a few things that shifted around um, where they were located. Um, so this is the final draft? This will be the one that's going to be reviewed at the public hearing on the 23rd. So two weeks from now, we've warned the public hearing, another public hearing for this. Um, so the red... And, and the other piece that was in there is a part of that. So you can replace those windows, you can replace roofing, you can replace siding. The only thing is provided it does not destroy character defining features and we defined what character defining features are. So in other words, if there was a, let's say a stained glass vestibule window, we may go through and say, yeah, you can, you can replace those other windows. This one is a character defining feature. It's, it's really unique. It's part of this building that it has this. Um, last 15. Page yeah. 15. Yeah, so they're part, like page nine has a little bit of the character defining feature. And so that's where, oh, sorry, that was the other yeah. other thing we should mention is that it wasn't that you could replace anything. Like if you wanted to replace roofing, as long as you're replacing with this, with a like material, that's fine. The only time that becomes an issue is if there's, if it's gonna impact character defining feature. So, um, so that was, as I said, we um, we cleaned up a few places where it replicated things in other parts, like demolition, um, limitations of development in 4413. So those are a couple of places where we said, look, it's already talked about in other places. You don't want to say it twice in the, by in the bylaws. You really only want to say things once. So um, we had a couple of those little things that we cleaned up. You know, having rules that say the outdoor lighting has to meet the rules of 3204, well, it already has to meet the requirements of 3204, so. Those types of things, so that was, uh, unless you guys wanna go through these on a more um, careful, detailed point, we were. Can I just? Mm -hmm. Ask. We probably talked about this before, but on page ten, where it's talking about architectural features, I mean, you've taken out on historic buildings because it's already part of this section, right? Yes. Okay. So the entire section is on, on historic buildings. Historic so, buildings. Yep. Okay. Um. So why was uh the basically the guts of architectural features struck out. Uh, this is uh, uh, Roman number six, one. Um, so it was architect, what we did was, the architectural features is already defined in in back, so we it, so it's going to read now. Architectural or character defining features prevailing on the existing building shall be considered in the alteration of a building. Shall be considered. Okay. Yeah, and that was the language that was already there before. Because okay, these were so design it was, review felt guidelines. That it was better not to uh, enumerate them. Yes. Because they're enumerated back here. Because that's the Because it's definition. defined later on. And we didn't want to define it differently. So Right. Well, that's And that was true. one of the things we were just trying to avoid. Um. Yeah, see, if you look down at the bottom of page 10, there is a rule, door, door placement, appearance, materials, and size shall be preserved on primary facades, but at the start, it already had exempted those. So we had this inconsistency, so we just kind of had to pull things together. To, so windows and doors that are not character defining may be replaced, but such replacements must be compatible with the historic building style, material, and architectural features. 
but that's now an administrative permit, so. Okay. So the red strikeouts happened after the public hearing? After the public hearing, okay. yes. And the blues are additions and the greens are moved. And some words were changed because they didn't have definitions like historic building material. So we just went to character defining materials. So that way, because we have a definition for that. So we did some adjusting, so that way we were more consistent in our wording. So again, th these aren't really things that maybe technically change the, the meaning, but from an administrative standpoint, if you've got words that are not defined, you might as well use words that are defined, so. <coughs> So was that the reason to take out ADA design principles? Um, page 11. It was, uh, that, it's already going to be involved in other development, in, in other requirements in the regulations. Hmm. So okay. as a so part of access, as a like part of your site plan requirements, you're going to be meeting those requirements. Seemed the, a better place to put them over there. Than yeah, and there isn't any there aren't any specific design review standards there. Uh -huh. So we might as well just, you know, if there was an additional level of, of requirement, then we could put it in there. But if the requirement is no different than what you have to meet anyways. And we also sent around in the email, which I didn't print out, were the changes to the rest of the Unified Development Regulations, which were pretty, really benign. Because we're cha making changes here, some of the references and some of the lines and other things, especially in like the DRC procedures, we just had to go and acknowledge that the administrative officer had some authorizations. Consistency and then define terms, character defining materials, how to go under materials, character defining. Because you've got feature, character defining, structure, contributing, structure, non contributing. That, that should be materials, comma. I think so. All the others are that way, so. And 
and this was the final map. Not that there's any cha any changes from when we last talked. We had talked about what possible things to change, and we didn't make any changes except for a little thing on Hubbard Street. I think that was about it. So we've got uh, the final map. It's there, and these are all online for anyone who wants to download them from the website. Mike, can you remind me why you shed some vistas was taken out? We don't have any rules at this point. We don't have any any standards or any maps and I mean that's a that's a really pretty much the definition of what the JAM golf decision says is you if you're going to regulate something, especially scenic or view sheds or vistas, you can't just go and say we're going to protect scenic views. You got to say what the scenic views are, where they views from, um, and so I think we can have, um, and I think we do still include views of the dome, but we don't have views generally, and so we'll add those we'll add those re regulations back in once we do a study that goes through and says. These are the views we want to protect and from more where. More specifically than this. Definition. Yeah, we need to be more specific. Um, yeah. It's kind of like protecting open space. And, you know, is protecting open space a, a, a field, or is protecting open space a bunch of trees? Because basically, if you're protecting open space, then anything not developed is yeah protected, and you can't develop anymore. Scrub and who knows what else. Yeah. So usually you got to go through and define what your views are that you want to protect. Anything else? No. So this will be presented. This will be the public hearing on the 23rd, two weeks from today. Next. And I will not be here unless my trip to Baltimore area gets canceled. And then besides that, we don't own insurance. And if anyone has questions, anyone in the public or anyone around here has questions, um, you can always shoot me emails um, for the design review hearing. And after this one, it would go to, if we approve it on the 23rd, it'll go to City Council and there will be another hearing with another opportunity for public comment. So. Okay, next is review of the draft aspirations and goals of the implementation strategy for the economic development chapter. So I didn't print out more economic development chapters. Oh, Do you want me to go print one, one out? Yeah, I'm sorry, I brought the wrong set of materials. I couldn't find it digitally either. Yeah, that's okay. good, I was hoping that I could. It is short, right? Okay, well I can go and print yeah. it out real quick. Yeah, and also, um, Sorry, I did print out some um, transportation ones. Um, they're going to be having a meeting tomorrow night to talk about aspirations and goals before they work on strategies. So I, I figured I'd give you guys the heads up of where they were at. Okay. Let me go print out a couple economic goals. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> now, back to business. <laughs> guys, digress. Yeah, we did. We did digress pretty quickly. All right, so. So I guess one of the first questions. <laughs> no vote was taken. <laughs> um, was whether I mean we've we've been calling it economic development. The city council has goals, and they've couched theirs in the term community prosperity. So I don't know if there's a preference for. I don't think it makes a difference, but. There's a thought we can always adjust this to be the chapter name is community prosperity and kind of build off that. Um, I feel like community prosperity could mean lots of things. Okay. Not and just we, economic development. We have a, a development corporation, right? So. Yes. And, and my hope would be by the end, we it's not structured around all of these like 
sections. Anyway, so I guess my point is, I don't know. It doesn't oh. matter. Okay. Wait, how, how would you envision it? Hmm? Being structured around what then? Let's say uh, there's like three common themes or something. Or it could be like people in place and, or around three big ideas. Okay. And there are just components of all of these things. Like when you read through these, I'm sure they come up in other sections as sure. well, right? So you're hoping to sort of tie it to a larger narrative or theme. It's, no, I mean, that's fine. Yeah. I, I was just curious, like, what you were thinking. So. <laughs> so it, we can, as I said, it, that was just one question that came out as I was looking through things. Um, the goals, um, we had a, we, we went through a lot when I was working with Laura, who was the MDC director before, um, to try to come up with some way of capturing the aspiration. And it turned out to be, you know, a little bit long. It's the, the sentence plus, plus the five bullets because we were just, you know, economic development means different things to different people. Um, so what did we want to see? What's our future vision? Um, you know, robust economy, strong job market, living wages, um, qu rich quality of life, um, and this would be accomplished through educated work, trained workforce, flexible and efficient building stock managed by responsible owners and commercial landlords, business economic climate that encourages and supports businesses, a strong sense of place, quality built environment, ample supply of necessary utilities and services, and a high quality and affordable place to live for employees. So those would be the five things that we would break into different goals and then break down further into strategies. Um, so that was kind of where we ended up. It was, and then, and then she left after we kind of got things going. So we hadn't fully um, fleshed out each one of the basically five sets of goals. There's a set of goals to maintain an educated and trained workforce. It was felt that we have an educated and trained workforce, so we were really looking at maintaining that. Um, and what would be the pieces that we would do to do that. Um, the next goal was to improve our building stocks, to make it more flexible and efficient, well-constructed. thought was our building stock is old. It's not necessarily there to maintain its current condition, but we do need to make improvements. Uh, goal C, to maintain and enhance the success of local businesses through attention expansion programs as well as support of startups and entrepreneurs. So the thought was we do a good job. We've got a lot of strong local businesses, but we need to, you know, we want to maintain that. Um, they, they felt, or at least Laura felt, uh, the need to improve our local business and economic climate. maintain and improve the sense of place, quality of public built environment, and to improve the quality uh, of affordability of Montpelier as a place to live and work. So um, a couple of places to improve, a couple of places to maintain or continue. So remembering our goals are supposed to be reflecting a status, kind of a status update. Are we looking to maintain something? Are we looking to improve something? Are we looking to transform something? So it's not, there's no transformatives in here. It's really maintain and evolve. Um, and then we get into the strategies underneath that on how to do each one of those goals. I don't know if people had any thoughts either on the aspiration that we had come up with. It's, I had worked on this in a number of different ways of trying to structure it. We had five aspirations, you know, one for each one of these, and we were kind of like, it's just, just not working, so we kind of pulled it together into one, because there kind of was a theme of the robust economy, strong job market, livable wages, that type of stuff, but these other pieces kind of get to those, you know, how we do that. So if those are the goals, though, do they need to be up here in the aspiration, or can it just be that first sentence, and then each one of these is a goal? Just how it's laid out. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it, so basically eliminate the, this will be accomplished through 
stuff. Yeah. It just that doesn't follow the format of the other ones. It doesn't follow the format of the other ones because yeah. usually we try to have goals that are parsed from the aspiration. This would just maintain that consistency. And then again, as, as I said, she unfortunately left. She was a really good person to work with, really good partner on this. Um, but I think we got a number of good pieces in here. Um, I was going through, after our last meeting and before this one, I was going through and just, I was handwriting in priorities and whether a couple of these strategies were needed. But I guess we'll, if we get through the, the aspirations and goals, then I'll go through what my comments were on the strategies. Um, I thought I thought the goals and aspirations were, were good, but I'm always willing to On the aspiration, yep. on the aspiration, I like that there's a mention of a diverse, sustains a diverse community. But I wonder if we need of all ages. That feels like it's caveating. Like we only care about age diversity. Mm. Can we just dump of all ages, or perhaps expand upon it? But then I worried if we tried to expand upon it, it would listen then get whoever's, lost, whoever's lost, whoever's lost out gets. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it seems unnecessary. Of all ages, okay. seems a little unnecessary to me. So, with that. So there's one benchmark here for goal C. Would the idea be to put bench? include benchmarks for other the other goals yeah they never um they never came up with benchmarks we tried to draw them out of the edsp and most of the edsp ones fell into that goal c to add 20 new establishments um the increased meals receipts um so a little bit of history on the on the mdc for members of the public and members here um the MDC and the, e, the so the Economic Development Strategic Plan was adopted in 2016, maybe 16 or 17, and then the Montpelier Development Corp was created after that. Um, and so, what the Economic Development Strategic Plan said was, the city needed to invest um, $100,000 a year for five years, and that that money would go to support the MDC and a director and the director's job was to grow the grand list grow our tax bases and grow the revenues coming in such that after five years we are basically taking in more than five hundred thousand dollars in new tax revenue and therefore it would justify continuing to have an MDC that's a little bit of the philosophy behind what was going on. So some of these goals you see in here are targeting meals and rooms receipts will go up by 30%, rooms and meals receipts will go up 42%. One of the primary goals of the Economic Development Strategic Plan was and is uh, the construction of the hotel. And so this was back before the hotel was on the drawing board. It was. Um, we, we didn't have a location for the hotel. We didn't know where one would go, but their job was going to be to, to find a location because the market analysis said that we are deficient and really could support another large-scale hotel. So that, that was their goal. The advantage of the hotel is they're usually um, very good generators of tax revenue from a standpoint of property taxes. But they, because we are a community that has the meals and rooms tax, we get 1% on the meals and rooms tax, so we get those added revenues. So um, getting another hotel means generating a lot more revenues for our coffers. So that's their big goal is to make sure we can get that hotel built. Um, that hasn't happened yet, but that's so that's a little bit of where they're at so when you see these things of trying to increase how in the world are they can increase meals and rooms by 32 percent and and um, these other ones by 42 percent well that's just 
mostly from by getting a hotel and more people in the downtown. I think what's missing in this is it seems like maybe implicit, but essentially increasing the value of our, our grand list. Right? Like, so that was a that was there was a question that was presented to MDC and to the city council and one of them is and, and that it basically is what is your what's your metric how are we going to measure the success how does the economic the mdc director know if they've been successful because you can grow the grand list without creating any jobs or new businesses you can create new jobs and businesses without growing the grand lists you can you know there's a lot of things we could for lack of a better term, say the GDP. You could grow the GDP. Um, you have the same number of employees, the same number of buildings. We haven't invested in our buildings. We haven't grown the grand list. But each business is doing 30% better business and therefore generating more, you know, more GDP. So, you know, what's our metric? What is, what is success in Montpelier from an economic development standpoint? And that was a hard thing for Laura and folks to figure out and to get out of the city council because you know what, what's our goal is it to get more businesses is it to grow the grand list because the tools like tax stabilization the policies we we have tax stabilization but what should those policies within the tax stabilization support if we want to grow the grand list then we really should be having tax stabilization that says if you grow the grand list we'll give you a tax stabilization if it's creating livable wage jobs, then we should say, we'll give you a tax stabilization if you create livable wage jobs. So you want to go and, so what, what's the metric? And, and believe it or not, the growing the grand list didn't come up, and that's why it's not in here. That's not to say I wouldn't have pushed for that. Yeah, I mean, uh, the idea that it's one or the other, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. And all of these things are basically trying to target increasing, you know, it it's maybe seems like a crude or unromantic way of putting it, but increasing the value of our buildings, like making our, it's literally increasing the value of our community, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we want. We want, and, and I think uh, adding to that, uh, looking at the, um, uh, the input, like our, how much are we spending in terms of public services versus how much are we returning on um, on our grant list. So basically improving the yield of using our space more efficiently, right? So targeting those under underutilized areas, you know, like the, the pit or um, there's probably quite a few of them in town and getting a better um, increasing, I guess, the we're going to measure it, the like grand list, in terms of, with regard to the amount of public services we provide. I'm sure there's a. I'm, uh, I'm happy to use the grand list as a as a metric, um, and I think, absent a MDC director, which we don't have right now, I mean, we may be more the planning commission may be more in the driver's seat of deciding what our metrics are going to be. Um, it. Um, just as a little bit of perspective for some some things that typically communities would look for that might not be appropriate for Montpelier, um, growing the number of jobs. Now, I know we've got in here growing the number of jobs, but Montpelier is actually the second highest jobs per capita in the state of Vermont. We have a lot of jobs, um, and I think the, the what uh, Bill had told me was only Williston has more jobs per capita. Um, and what that means is just, you know, we've got um, a population of 8,000 and probably 4,000 people in the workforce, 3,000, 4,000 in the workforce, but we've got 9,000 jobs. Because of commuters. Because of the people that commute in. So the question is, do we really need more jobs in Montpelier? I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're basically the more jobs that we create in Montpelier, it's just more commuters that are driving in. We don't 
We need to create more population. We need to create more population. You know, if that's the here. issue, we have more people live here, so that way we have less commuters. But so we need more housing. Yeah, right. is, is our goal yes. is our goal more really more jobs? Um, should we be benchmarking mm -hmm. our the MDC and these other folks to creating more jobs here in Montpelier, um, or should it be that's great if the jobs are created, but we're not. That's not what we're driving towards. Um, well, it's, I mean, what kind of jobs? Is it just more state jobs or broad diversity of jobs, different types of jobs? Yeah, or and we can be more specific about which one um, that happens. And historically, we haven't really been growing private sector jobs. That was part of what the EDSP was looking at. In our economic development person who came in really felt that was a problem and we should be growing more local jobs. But um, from 2008 or 9, 2009 to 2014, I think we had a 10 private sector jobs. You know, obviously there's some that came, some that left, but pretty much it was a wash. Um, then we had a bump up in the number of state jobs because of Irene, and then a bump down in the number of state jobs once the repairs to Waterbury were done. So we kind of had this bump up and down, and then we've had some modest increase in private sector jobs, but. By and large, we're still right around where we were. Um, maybe we've gained 80 jobs in the next five years, 2014 to 19. So is that good? I, I think it's good. We created some jobs, but. What about but, population? Housing was one of the keys. That's why it actually is, you know, the. the um, in there is a high quality affordable place to live but really that comes down to building more housing um, as an economic development goal and I think if you talk to City Council they would probably agree housing they see housing as economic development oh, yeah. should it be stronger yeah. in, in here then we could I mean certainly these I, I made five bullets and we could certainly move these bullets around if we wanted to move them up move them down in in where we see I didn't rank them as anything more than just those were the five that came out. I didn't think educated workforce is more important than anything else, but we could certainly rank them, move them up, put this as a primary. It seems like we may have a lot of jobs, but the number of people who are coming here as commuters, are they helping our businesses downtown is the biggest question. Are they adding to the business utilization? And I don't see that happening. And I think it depends where. So the most recent job additions, um, Caledonia Spirits. Yeah. Um, the Armory Building, which is past the roundabout as you start heading out towards Agway, the first, the first right. There's that's the old Armory. Mm -hmm. um, what was what did that be? The, uh, uh, Connor put in a. Um, there's a medical billing facility that's ah. in that location there. So we've added some jobs in there. Again, good paying jobs. But again, as you start to look at where these new buildings are located, uh, it's not like somebody has come into the downtown and dropped in a, uh, another insurance company with 150 people with good paying jobs who are going to walk out and buy lunch every day and walk over to the local store and pick something up on the way home. Um, predominantly where we've been locating new businesses is is at our peripheries, which can't be that unexpected considering how densely we're built built up in the downtown. A lot of the stuff that happens downtown are a lot of smaller units, you know, di small office space, those types of things rented out to lobbyists and lawyers and and those folks. Um, and they, being downtown, have more more of an opportunity to. Um, to pay for those, but they also, you know, on the other side of the coin, they're also adding to the number of cars that have to come downtown because if we add more of those jobs downtown mm -hmm. and the people are commuting in, we've got to account for that. So, um, so it's almost which comes it, back to housing. Which comes back to housing. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, it goes back to housing. Having the second highest jobs per capita doesn't really benefit our downtown in a way to increase business. That's the idea. Yeah, I mean, it increases the value. I mean, going to the grand list, that increases the value of land in the downtown, which increases the grand list and increases. Well, there isn't necessarily a relationship there. There could be some really bad, inefficient development. True. It has a ton of jobs and 
it's just a sea of parking. So. Mm -hmm. Seems like a bit bigger emphasis on population and housing. And certainly, increasing the population has a lot of secondary benefits too. So, just increasing the, the number of people who have the ability. If we went from a town of 8,000 to a town of 10,000 people who are residents, the extra 10% of people that are you know, especially if the development is within a walking distance to the downtown, is going to provide a more vibrant downtown. Um, more, you're going to be more likely to be, you know, shopping in the downtown, working in the downtown, recreating in the downtown, and just generally having more secondary benefits to the economy, just having people living here. Right, and that seems like it's a pretty important goal for economic development. So the, the, the reference here was a high quality, affordable place to live for employees. Do you want to just strike the four employees and just go and talk about? Yeah. Where? Uh, it was one of the, part of the aspiration, last the last goal. aspiration. Oh. Um, yeah. So the, it's, it's kind of a weird, like who thinks of themselves as an who identifies as an employee? <laughs> I think you're, where it comes from. An employee. Yes. <laughs> I think where it comes from is when you're looking at the when you talk to the businesses. So if you talk to National Life, they will talk about the reason why they have a difficult time getting people to relocate to Montpelier to work at National Life is the inability to find housing for their employees. So their employees don't take this job here; they work at a different. Um, location because they just can't find, um, you know, whether it's executive housing for people who are in that uh, income bracket or the lower income management, middle income management. So I think part of this is really having an adequate supply of housing. This last one's a high quality and affordable place to live. It's an, having an adequate supply. I don't know what adequate means. I don't know if we'd ever actually get to adequate. But As an aspiration, you don't have to be really specific. Um, we know we don't have enough. Right. Right now. An adequate supply of high quality affordable? Yes. Uh, or I thought in the housing uh, section we were talking about a nine month stock. Well, we'll probably well probably the goal out of this, some of the goals and policies out of this, will be in support of the housing plan. But it's just important to connect connect the dots between these, you know, to, to know there's a, a very strong connection between the housing and what the housing task force does and what the economic development future is. Which is why, in my head, like John's, I think it's a lot easier to look at these not in their own individual silos, but try and figure out what are the connections between them all. And which we will get to. When we get to that point, it's going to make it a lot easier to, to conceptualize. Yeah. At some point, we've got to do a land use plan, which really starts to not only draw the separate chapters, but pull them into. Mm -hmm. So we can have a goal that's really about housing, but also really about economic development at the same time. And it's the same goal, because. Yeah. And when we're getting to our themes, probably, it, and it wouldn't be a surprise seeing what the strategic plan that the city council has talked about for years. What's in the 2009 plan that we've readopted? What's been consistently talked about is this need to increase housing and the issue of affordable housing. So these things, it's going to pop up in. I mean, housing will be in four or five chapters right off the bat. So it'll be easy that that may end up a theme that gets talked about. Can I ask a question about goal B? Yes. Because you have the strategy with the. Um uh, code improvements, and then it lists out a number of tax credits. Can you can you speak to that? Okay, so the goal um, to improve our building stock to make it more flexible, efficient, and well maintained. So, if our goal, you know, we're talking to economic developers, we've got some building stock. They're they're kind of thinking of a little bit of remember they're they're talking a little more commercial than residential. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got housing stock that needs a lot of work. Um, and it's expensive to fix up. 
what is available to help is um, through the federal government and state, we have historic tax credits, facade improvement credits, code improvement tax credits, technology tax credits, and brownfield credits. These are all through the downtown program. These are all programs. What we have is um, Kevin Casey, who's our community development specialist, is somebody who can write those grant applications for people. Now, a number of these individuals who own these buildings are already aware of how to apply for these tax credits, but not all of them do. So a number of them come in, and we help them write the tax credits. And there's um, a lot, um, or there's a big proposed increase this year in the governor's budget, too. I like this as a measure as well. I don't know how. I think they're they're all tracked and they're relative. They may be relatively easy to to track up. But if we look at you know we've taken advantage of this many tax credits. It's a good indicator of that. We're, yeah. I mean, it's a little it's a little historical. reactionary than pro mm -hmm. proactive. So it's sometimes tough to measure, you know, success or failure. It can certainly be reflective of, of what's going on. Um, yeah. But you don't want to benchmark Kevin with making sure he does five of these applications because you might not have anybody who comes in asking for them. But sure. I, guess, uh, I guess my qu my question is a little more basic, which is the the strategy indicates that in other technical assistance for business for business for building owners who need work on code improvements such as. Oh, so whether, so, so whether it's just so, strike the code word? No, I guess I'm sort of wondering, like, are there currently code deficiencies? <laughs> that need to, I, I guess I don't understand, like, where we are today, what needs to be improved, and how, we, and how do we get there? And it's just the way that it's... The way that it's sort of framed right now, I don't understand. Yeah, maybe it's, maybe the word code come, could come out, it's, who need work on yeah. improvements. Because it makes it sound like... The, the bulleted items are code improvements. Yeah, but right. Not. Then yes. we want to invest in our building stuff and improve it, right? And so and is, these are a bunch of tools to do. Is that. the concern yeah. is that, that the current building owners are not adequately taking advantage of those tools, and we need to figure out ways to encourage them to do that through providing technical assistance, or is there something else going on? I'm just trying to make sense of. Um, why those are listed out and what we are not doing with those currently. Well, we have been taking advantage of some of them. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to keep it up. Okay. Like the above Abishans and then the transit center and all of that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for these programs. Okay. Yeah. It's, it still reads poorly. Um, yeah. Technical assistance for building owners who need work on improvements such as what the rep bulleted items are is the technical assistance not the improvements mm -hmm. so it yeah I think it just oh okay yeah you see how it's reading it's confusing okay is it really just sort of coming down to the we need to continue to provide assistance in uh, taking advantage of these things technical yeah. assistance yeah. for building yeah. things <laughs> <that. laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. I could probably ball. fold in the growth centers and downtowns as well too. So yeah. like, okay. continue to part participate in these designated programs and right, and, okay. and provide assistance for any uh, associated tax credits. Right. Still list the tax credits. Yeah, I don't know that we need and to. Well, I think okay. it's helpful to see the the range of tax credits. I mean, they might change though. They're interesting. That's why I put, the, yeah, that's why I put the such as with just to, to let yeah. people yeah. know. These, yeah, these, this right. when we're talking about this, this yeah. is what we're talking about. Like, I, I didn't realize yeah. that there were this many different. It brings it to life a little bit. Yeah. Well, that strategy seems way more manageable now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So the, it's not the improvements. So we'll just need to. <clears throat> so it will just read other technical assistance for building owners. Such as. Such as. Okay. And again, remember at the last meeting we talked about reshuffling these, so that way we'll pull all the continue to the bottom. Yep. We will um, mm. bike rack some of the ones that that uh, getting everyone else to use that now. Why are we bike racking it? Because <laughs> I said uh, put them in a parking lot, and everyone said we don't put things in parking lots anymore. We put them in bike, bike. racks. Well, I had so. just heard it like that day. They're, they're <laughs> spreading. So it's thick. So it's spreading fast. 
Um, or do we want to do that today or some? Uh, we, I mean, we don't, we, we don't have to. Um, the only one I, I had picked out so far was at the top of that page and on page two. I guess this page isn't numbered, but for the MDC to have to develop an outreach program that connects workforce training by partners, including CCV, through the state, that our businesses need to understand the community. I put that as a priority low. I didn't know if it was needed. Um, yeah. That's one of those ones I would probably stick in the bike rack. Yeah. Good idea. It's not something a municipality yeah. should be doing. Yeah, and it wasn't a priority. I mean, I mean, we want to make sure we educate and train folks, but it, we probably have the most educated workforce mm -hmm. in the state, I would bet. I mean, it's really crazy if you look at the statistics of... Underemployed. Yeah, 50... Yeah. 50% of people have master's degrees and above. It's or some it's a ridiculous word. It's it's, it's a ridiculous number. Um, yeah. This this goal is maybe like a when you think about maintaining an educated and trained workforce it might be a bit awkward. Is that, like is that really our goal or is our goal that our employers have you know, the supply meets the demand? Whether to people to match are education and workforce training with. Appropriate employment. Well, is the end goal really to have people be or educated or trained, or is it like that we have <coughs> people they have jobs, and the employers who have jobs have the right people? Right. I don't know. Everybody's happy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's worth how to match. <laughs> um, that was where we came up with. We wanted to focus on the on the worker as opposed to framing the worker as a commodity was kind of what we were trying to do is to make sure, you know, we care about educating the people who are in the workforce um, as opposed to saying if we want the, if we want to make sure we've got the right mix, then it might mean, Barb, you've got to go because mm -hmm. we've got a better fit who's going to take over. <laughs> right. My job is. And you'll be like, hey, wait, I'm, I'm a resident of Montpelier. And it's like, yeah, but you're not the right resident. We yeah. need a better resident than you, Barb. It fits gonna, in that training. Fits yeah. in our. Um, so that was why we framed it. But knowing there's a different, uh, different way to peel it. Yeah. Um, but do, on the other hand, then, do we want to take steps to create more work opportunities for our highly educated yeah. workforce. Um, and create more jobs? Now yeah. Back. yeah. Um, so yeah, I, that's, so that comes back to, to see, I mean, we talked about wanting to increase the housing um, and their focus was on creating new, 20 new establishments and increasing the, ta the taxes. And increasing John mentioned- taxes. Oh, increasing uh, increasing the rooms and meals. Yeah. Receipts. 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 We yeah, want more we, people. Not, we don't get those. We need to get more people <laughs> drinking and eating downtown. Danger, danger. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know, again, this, these were where they had come up with from. Can I ask another yep. quick follow-up question on that? Uh, the 30% meals receipts and the 42% rooms and meals receipts. Is You were saying that that was sort of that was keyed to the construction of the new hotel. Is that mm -hmm. exclusively keyed to that, or is there other sort of considerations that went into that calculation? It was keyed mostly to the hotel. Okay. And I, I think there's one thing that's, it must be something wrong in here, because one says meals and one says rooms and meals, so there yeah, must be rooms and, because there should be, I think there's alcohol, it's the other one in there, so uh, one of these should say alcohol and one should be meals and rooms or something like that. It says over five years, 2021. Is that five years after 2021? No, it's because it started in 2016. It was 2016. Right, so this needs to be the, yeah, updated. Was, yeah, well that was like, as we said, when we were working on this, that we were pulling out what was their, their metrics, knowing that we'll probably have to adjust it. Um, yeah, it's just the reason why I ask is because like 42% is a pretty precise number. <laughs> yeah, it is, it it is very precise because I think they were looking at a very specific target of hitting that $100,000 a year in revenue. So I think they were looking at okay. if we get <laughs> this sense. this bite here in alcohol and we get this bite out of rooms and this bite out of meals, then 
then you, then you hit, then you break even. Then we break our hundred thousand dollar target. I mean, shouldn't we have an idea um, included in here with Airbnb? There's an increase in rooms and meals. Yep. So, but do we even know what that is for Montpelier? I don't know, but again, what they're what they what they would say is. Um, doesn't really matter how we increase it. Um, we could go for the home run and just get the hotel and we're done. Or we're going to have to do this by a lot of little bites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, that's Airbnb. what just saying is it's not strictly the hotel. Yes, it doesn't have not to be strictly, strictly, strict, strictly yeah. just the hotel. So we're already doing some of this, but we just don't know how much. Yeah. And again, being without an, uh, an MDC director, they're, they're doing what they can through their board of directors at this point. Explain again what the Ignite the Fire loan program That was what they called it. That was, and we can certainly, now that she's not here, we can always change that. So the idea was we have Economic Devel Development Revolving Loan Fund, and we worked with one of the banks on State Street and someone and, and, and a th another person um, to kind of come up with what you would need um, to help provide gap financing or some working capital or funds, um, because sometimes banks are willing to provide fifty thousand dollars, and you really need sixty or seventy. Mm -hmm. And or they're willing, banks are willing to fund the capital improvements. But in order to do the capital improvements, you need to shut down for a month, and you're going to lose ten thousand mm. dollars. So how do we come up with the ten thousand dollars so they can continue to pay their employees and pay their bills? Well, they can make these improvements. Well, we can provide gap financing, and the businesses themselves and the MDC director came up with these. And this was just, you know, how can we get people who are just on the edge of saying, "I will be willing to invest, but I just, I just need this to get through that." And so, they, you know, because we have the the revolving loan fund funds that have been sitting there. We said, how could how could we best use sixty thousand dollars to help you guys? And they said, well, being able to do these small loans would be able to help. So that's what it is: is can we get these small businesses, you know, you know, the Onion River Sports or the whatever, to go through and say we can, you know, we need to grow. We can't grow unless we can do this, and that's kind of the thought. Ignite the fire, collect the insurance money. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Now we have to rename it. Obviously, because that's, work. that's now in the record. <laughs> yeah. Well done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially if there's some coincidence where that happens to happen during a <laughs> yeah. Ignite the Fire Test. Loan Program, and then shortly thereafter. Um, but that's the idea. Thanks. So are there new programs in here? Are there new programs? Um, there's, there's public education outreach and training, which are, I feel like those are the poster children of new programs that get created in plans that like ever happen and probably <laughs> shouldn't. They're just like, well, we should probably do more training, education, and outreach. And there definitely is a need for Know, communications plans and things like that, but this is kind of a um, so yeah. I mean, there was one on the second page about uh, development of the pit. That's new. They they an MDC was going to take the the spearhead that. So I had that as a priority. A medium going to be a cost high. MDC would do it. At the bottom of the page, establish guidelines for the Economic Development Revolving Loan Fund. Um, that's a priority high, cost low. That's with Kevin working on that. He is working on We have the Ignite the Fire Loan Program. That would be a new program using those RLF funds. Uh, supports, supports, MDC to create business monitoring. Learn of opportunities and threats. 
I had a question on that one whether that's continue or create. I mean, that's just, these are some things that an MDC director should be doing anyways. Kind of understand what's going on, make sure they've got a pulse on things. <coughs> So oh, then you were talking about the marketing, right. or yeah. Yeah, you got the marketing program, which I think they actually have. Montpelier Live does marketing, education and outreach. I think they wanted to make sure they, um, MDC and Montpelier Live to create public outreach and education to on the value of economic development to help garner more support for projects in the future. Again, this was out of their their goals. Um, they felt a lot of times when these projects come up, they don't get a lot of support from the public. So they wanted to make sure people understood the value of it. Maybe it's just writing stuff in the newspaper. Maybe it's, it's articles in the bridge. Um, yeah. So I don't see a lot of new projects, not like generic economic development. Yeah, they're not looking to educate business owners, um, which of course is always a possible always a possible thing to do. Um, but most of these look like they were things to continue doing. Can we toss in the neighborhood development areas? Uh, put in ND, the NDA program? Yeah. Uh, I think it's in housing, but we can put it in under. Where would that go? Um, could be under E can, or F. Yeah, 12. It's in a number of these places. Oh, anywhere the, the strategy. Oh, anywhere like kind of where designated downtown yeah. is, put in NDA. Oh. Group all the designated programs together. So you're saying, bring the designated downtown and the neighborhood program together? No, yeah, there's like uh, it's just another designation program, and and I'm not sure. I think there are a few other benefits for housing development. Um, and it seems like. That's part of our economic development strategy. That would be a low cost, uh, mm -hmm. high, potentially high benefit. This one, as I said, hasn't been, because I finished it in December and was kind of waiting for the new director to come in, we never quite finished it up, but I think, so I don't know if you guys are comfortable with that. Someone, they're not going to hire They're not going to hire, they're not po reposting it. So you won't have anybody else to work with on this then? No. So we'll probably kind of work through and as I said, that's kind of a little bit of, you know, uh, kind of getting your, your feel for where you think this was going direction-wise. It seems like it's going in. Still has its clunkiness, but it, I think it hits the important points and talks about the programs that we do. Where does Montpelier Live fit in this? Uh, it's referenced in a, in a couple of different places. Um, it was intended. Um, when economic development came up, we talked about whether... Montpelier Alive should be our economic development corp, and they were not interested in doing that function, which is why we created the new one. So we kind of had three things. We could keep economic development in-house and put it in my office. We could couch it into Montpelier Alive, or we can spin off and create a new corporation. And in the end, it was the recommendation was to spin it off. Um, it can be complicated having it in-house um, because of your government. government and FOIA requests, and so people mm -hmm. want to have a confidential discussion about whether or not they want to locate a business in town, and next thing you know, it becomes public record. MDC doesn't have that. They can talk openly with people about what your, what your interests are. Are you looking to relocate? Are you looking to, you know, and not worry about having somebody FOIA that your business is leaving town. Um, so. That was kind of the advantage of having it outside. Um, and then, you know, should Montpelier Alive be the, the one responsible for it? Um, you know, they do a number of things. They do the, the, the vibrancy and the, so you'll see them referenced when it comes to having the vibrant downtown and those 
beautification projects and places like that. And if you think there are more places we need to include them, by all means, we can add in more strategies. But that's kind of where they plug in, is the organizing festivals and um, events, um, those types of marketing, marketing the downtown, branding the downtown. It's like that's part of our economic development strategy, right? Yeah. I think it needs to go into goal E. Goal E feels empty to me right now, which is the sense of place, quality of our public built environments. I'll get more. Uh, well, the sense of place piece feels a little bit. Um, yeah, it's kind of generic. Yeah. Is there anything like from either the economic development plan or not that you're alive that like? I want to say I was going to say that it exists alive, but it's not that you're alive. Like, I don't know, that gives us, are we, we're going to be like the gin capital of <laughs> North America, or is there something that, that, that gives a sense of what, what Montpelier is going to be, aside from like, have a great sense of place? Or, the beer capital will become, you know, you know a microbrewery. And if we don't, that's fine too. I'm just Governors. wondering. Like, oh. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know of any any uh, any theme that we have for our downtown. But I mean, I can I can check with check with Dan, see what what he what he may have. If there's something we can build into there. If there is, I feel like we should work yeah, towards yeah, it. Yeah, okay. Make sure that. Yeah, I agree. We if yeah we we don't have a lot of in in here, and I'll try to see where where we can increase uh, Montpelier Alive's connections Place in here for bureaucrats during the day. I thought we decided that it was Montpelier a decent place for humans. <laughs> <laughs> that was a while ago. Why can't we just stick with that? Too <laughs> <laughs> to, to <laughs> human. <laughs> I think it was. It was. I think it was just a decent, decent <laughs> place. <laughs> a decent place for humans. <laughs> <laughs> and their pets. So we're up with the animals. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Acceptable for humans. Great for dogs. <laughs> <laughs> What's the continue to plan for a project to upgrade the downtown streetscapes to make the entire downtown have a unified, pleasant, and safe appearance? Uh, so safe that, appearance is also safe appearance. Yes. Should also actually be safe. Yeah, actually, yeah, it actually shouldn't just appear safe. It <laughs> should actually be safe. <laughs> is that a th is that a plan that's ongoing or? Uh, yeah, I mean it's the the, the bo storyboards and stuff that are out in the hallway right now for the okay. downtown master plan. Got it. So okay. that um, that's the downtown master plan project. Yeah, I think it's supposed to be a, a unified and pleasant appearance, and also safe. <laughs> safe is supposed to be somewhere else. Yeah. It's okay, kid. It looks safe. <laughs> <laughs> Perception is reality. Is that what they say now? <sighs> it's true, because it could be safe, and you might not feel safe. Well, I agree. There's. I think it's true. You should feel safe, and it should also be safe. That's those little alleys on mm -hmm. down this block, right? Parking garages. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Berry Street, where there's no street lights at night. Oh, yeah. Super dark. It is safe, but it doesn't dark. feel it. Yeah. My basement. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a personal problem. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it out of the point. I'll create that. We'll create a program for in John's basement. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I can go through and work on these, uh, kind of clean these things up, add add um, the priorities, costs, um, and, and we can work on that a little. Yeah, bit. I'll just say that the priorities and costs piece is really helpful. The last time we did, we went through the historic district. Yeah, it's really helpful. And if you know, and again, we can we'll have another stab at this one, I think, just to make sure we can go through and think about it a little bit. Um, 
as I said, it's it's not as fully developed a plan as some of the other ones that you've gotten or will get. So um, if you think of things that you're like when you're walking home, or driving home, go and say, didn't talk about that. That's missing. Shoot an email. Do, do we have to modify um, bullet number two where it says the NBC is led by a part-time director? Is that the intention? Uh, the highlighted piece, these are things that we really have to go through, and I've got to clean up. I mean, these are just here almost as placeholders, not really going to be in the plan. Yeah. These were just to help educate people as they're reviewing these to go through and say, oh, okay, I didn't realize. But there is no director now. There is no director right now. And is the goal to eventually have a director, or are they not even looking that far? It doesn't look like they're looking for one right now, okay. so that not. may end up not having a director. So the implementation of all of this then falls on who? It will be their, their board of directors, and what they're trying to do is to either find people in-house that can do this, or they have the $100,000 a year in funding that they get from the city, and rather than take all that money and hire a director, they'll take that money and hire contractors to do various pieces. So, so they're going to be a much more active board of directors than Yeah, they'll buy, they kind of have to. Was that the case before, or is that going to be a ch change for them? Uh, well, it used to be that the board of directors would kind of oversee the executive director and kind of you know make recommendations. And now, because there's no executive director, they they have to, for example, hire the contractor as opposed to telling a director, yeah, hire a contractor to do that. So they're going to be implementing any of these strategies goals yep so, so we'll probably have to when we f finish this up I'll probably work with Kevin to go and meet with them because they meet early in the morning so we'll probably have do a presentation with them because this is where we came so we need to make you know that they should then be mentioned as the implementation yeah body I don't know what you Anything else with the economic okay. development implementation strategy? Did we want to switch the order or at least pull that last one up to the first one and then reorder? Well, have a high quality, affordable place to live up top. Oh, so it's F, the goal A. Pull, make goal F, goal A. We talked about maybe yeah. promoting it, making it, making sure it was. Are we talking about the high quality and affordable places to live? Or do we not care? The I, mean, I don't really order. care at this point. I don't mm -hmm. think okay. we need to make this. I mean, the focus should first be on the workforce. I mean, I just, I just see a lot of. I mean, I'm with John and Stephanie with this. I feel like there's a lot of tie-ins here that I see with predominantly the housing piece, and I think we'll probably end up just tying a lot of these things in with larger, with other sections anyway. So I don't know that. Mm -hmm. Prioritizing it here is gonna mean much. That's fine. We can get the content in, and then we can yeah, we'll move it. We can speak it later. Did you want to take a couple seconds and look at the transportation? Looks like we have a couple minutes. Um, Thirty-five minutes. Thirty-five so minutes. We, so we didn't. We don't have we to worry about the transportation. Right. So under. The under uh, there's a, there's a set of strategies in there. Just ignore those strategies because they haven't been working on them. So, what the transportation committee they have met already, and they um, they came up with on their own with some help afterwards to massage it. Three aspirations for transportation. Um, so the first aspiration uh, it's easy to live and work in Montpelier without a car. There is an integrated multimodal system that prioritizes active mobility and meets the mobility needs of all users. So that's one of the few.
future aspirations, Montpelier will have a built environment and transportation system that is safe, attractive, and contributes to a vital and, vi and lively community. And the third aspiration is Montpelier's transportation system will be sustainable and environmentally responsible. So they they went through because there's a lot to talk about in transportation. You not only have your walking, biking, and driving, and parking cars and public transportation, but you have the impacts of those and um, you know having a goal of you know things being safe and attractive. Um, so they had a lot of pieces and how they wanted to kind of you could. You could put all those pieces together in different ways, and this was how they decided to put them together. One that kind of talks about the system up top. The second one kind of talks about more specifically the infrastructure, and then kind of this third one that kind of gets into the the, the impacts. So, um, I think what I like what they have so far. I don't know if it seems like A says it all. And then B and C are the result of the of A. Okay. Well, we'll go through the goals and then see if we can, you know, if you think reshuffling it. Um, so the way they would accomplish this goal A um, is um, walking in Montpelier will be safer easier and more attractive. And then they'll have some strategies for how to meet that. And biking in Montpelier will be safer and easier. Mobility, the third one, mobility sharing options will be much more available. I think we, do you remember what? Um, oh, so mobility sharing is your car, share. car shares and your uh, different um, microtransit and other opportunities like that. Mm -hmm. um, public transit that would be public transit would is be four, better. will be more convenient and available. And five is more housing and commercial development in downtown. Montpelier will create a pedestrian core where trips can be completed without use of a car. So they kind of have these, these five primary goals in order to accomplish that. So this one didn't come out as as because they did a lot of this work themselves and working on this, it was a little less, you know, the economic development, the housing, and the historic kind of were very, as John John would say, very clunky. It just kind of, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, they, they have a little less of these real connections, but at the same time, I, I think it's there because the aspiration is talked about what they want to see you know, a multimodal system that prioritizes cars. And then they talk about the different modes of transportation, walking, biking, driving. And then I think the only thing they had been talking to me about at the last meeting when we talked was, all right, well, where, where does parking go? And I think we're still, I think parking ends, ends up somewhere in B. Where? In, in the next aspiration, B. Uh. But that was, their real thing was they wanted to get that aspiration um, that first statement, and they actually reshuffled things to make put that up first. That it is easy to live and work in Montpelier without a car. So there, the thought of that is, you know, that's the vision, that's the aspiration, that's what we want to get to. It's not saying we're going to take away your cars. It's not saying we're going to be. But what we wanted to do is to say it's possible. We want to have a Montpelier where it's possible to live without a car. Um, and if you have a car, great. But if you don't you can still live and work here just fine. And we're gonna do that by having things that are very readily walkable, readily bikeable, have micro transit that lets you um, move within that system and public transport transportation that will let you move greater distances. And you should be able to live and that's, that's the value they're trying to set up. And the rest of this is trying to fall into that. So their definition of public transit is outside the city? No, it's, it, I think they were just differentiating a little bit. Okay. Um, micro transit and, and some of these other ones generally are tend to be a little bit more last mile type stuff. Public transit, you know, if you were going to Burlington, you're probably not taking micro transit. You can't, yeah, yeah, yeah right. You're so, looking at public transit. Okay, right, so I think, yeah, that's not 
totally clear to me. Yeah, and yeah, there's some um, polish that still needs, but this is where they kind of, and as I said, it's, it's slightly different. I kind of liked a little bit of, remember how we were talking about maintain, evolve, transform? They made their statements for their goals more um, implicit rather than explicit about that. So um, biking will be safer. That's their way of saying it needs to be, you know, it's rather, it, rather than saying, which we would have said probably in these other plans, improve bicycle safety. They just threw out the words improved and said, you know, biking should be safer and easier. Will so, they come up with uh, strategies then for each one of these? They actually they ha already have a whole set of drafts okay. under so that's, this. That's what hasn't shown up yet. But um, they had been wrestling amongst themselves, and what we've been doing is taking it a step. In, in January, we approved the aspirations, and, or in February, we approved the aspirations. Tomorrow at the transportation, we'll approve the goals, and then we will finish filling in for the next meeting in April what all the strategies are. So, um, just yeah, my only feedback would be that less is more. That this gets at all of it. These happen if you do this. I think there could be other things you could add in the sustainable and environment or environmentally responsible beyond minimizing, making it so people don't have to use cars. So yeah, they're looking at under the uh, sustainable and envi environmentally responsible. They're they're going to be looking at stormwater, as well as um, yeah, storm climate water. impacts. Um, you know, people can drive. Can we get people to shift from fossil fuels to electric vehicles? Yeah. Or um, that's that's a, a different and again trying to capture the fact that you know two thirds of our working population are commuters. Um, so. But you're saying parking would go under? I think parking they were going to get B. under B, and I'm trying to remember. Um, moving around Montpelier will be safe for travelers. So what B was kind of looking at was more of the design. I can see mm -hmm. where John's going, where these A and B Those do, yeah. could have a certain amount. And I'll work with them. Um, but it integrates the built environment more. Aspiration B does. Yeah, B, and, and that was really when we, when we had it and we were developing it, what this was getting at was a little bit more of the... Um, The connection between yeah the because up top we are talking about having a goal that is safer and easier and more attractive and so if we're talking about safety in a why is it in B and but maybe that's B is a, talking about the built environment could be could incorporate things that wouldn't be touched on in a necessarily um, because this a is really about transportation about mobility guess that would be whereas B it almost it sounds as if they want to make sure that any development that happens would um, be easily accessible to transportation yeah I think number three the mobility sharing was also intended to touch on the um, the idea of an integrated system and maybe we need to add the integrated into that one. Mm -hmm. And the integrated system really gets to the ability to ride your bike or walk to the um, to the bus stop, and then you can being able to put your bike on the bus. You now have an integrated system. You've got an ability to shift between modes because you're not just going to take the bus to work. You may end up walking to take the bus, or mm -hmm. riding your bike to take the bus, or riding your bike. To, or driving a car to the bus station. Um, you're trying to integrate modes. Um, a park and ride would be a perfect example of a mobility sharing and integrated system where. I think the focus on, or the emphasis on mobility is good. Because that's what transportation is about, right? So, yeah, so I'll look at how maybe we collapse A and B together. And I'll, I'll see if that's 
once we get into it. I know there are reasons they they have. They were tough because they built so much strategies, and then they're trying to fit strategies into pigeonhole. So it's a little bit of wrestling with um, what is working on an integrated system like our. We have a complete streets plan, which is street typologies. So it really goes through and says what streets should you know what should East State have as a street type, you know, based on the amount of traffic and the amount of walking and the amount of biking and its topography. Should it have sidewalks on both sides, sidewalk on one side? And so we've got a typology map that goes through from a system standpoint what should be there. And then you have the next level, which is, um, you know, uh, maintaining, maintaining and plowing those sidewalks and streeping, sweep, sweeping streets so that way bikes can use the bike lanes if you're not sweeping the bike lanes and you know you've, so you've got another level that's like okay we built it the system is here now we've got this other level of of needs to make sure that it actually functions that sidewalks are plowed or that storm drains are clear so that way we're not walking through puddles and you know your scooters are charged your sc <laughs> <laughs> And they're strong enough to get Such you up a short-lived little yeah. blip. East State got was stuck it. going up north. Like, I'm not sure. Oh, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> East State was a real yeah, problem. There were a lot of them oh, on East State. Like, there was a moment where they were being abandoned. Only got this far. Okay. <laughs> I guess the e-bikes are a little bit more reliable, but not as much fun. Um, so I, yeah, I'll look at those. So um, you know, the built environment, as I as I said, it was supposed to be looking a little bit less at the at the at the system, and so maybe there's a few words that need to get moved and shuffled a little bit. Well, once they start to put the strategies in place, maybe it's going to become clearer yeah. why we need. Yeah, because the next one was, as I said, if you look at the goals, um, you know, it's supposed to be safe. We're supposed to be looking at how do we make things safe for travelers. Um, is That's attractive also in the first one, and it is talked down. about in the first one. Um, yeah. But it, yeah, and I think this is where it's supposed to be looking a little bit more at some of the other pieces. Mm. Um, so they're still working we'll on this. They are still working. They're working, as I said, they're working on the goals tomorrow. They're going to get the goals approved, and then we'll work on some of the strategies. Um, okay. But I think my, my sense is they've done a pretty good job of capturing the big things that need to get talked about. Now, how we can get them organized um, to make a lot of sense. As it's, These guys had five and then three, and they had everyone come up with them, and there's been a lot of shuffling and moving pieces and parts. And then they'll move a piece, and then they'll realize, like, parking parking doesn't have a home we really should have something on parking so at least we can talk about you know are we going to use demand management for parking are we going to not have any parking in the downtown we just need to have a place where we talk about what our parking policy yeah would be. so that are would we actually gonna, become a goal yeah, do we want on street parking or not on street parking or is it just so they would add a goal for parking I'm not sure if it's going to be in, in the goal, if there'll be a specific one that talks about it, or if it's just going to be part of the policies that go into the transportation system. The one thing that is missing and uh, doesn't necessarily need to be part of this plan, but probably should be, is I think we need to address the, um, uh, the rail line in terms of what they don't need to come up with what the solution is, but I think one of our goals needs to be we need to figure out what the plan is for it. You mean the one that's coming through the city, not the one that goes to New York? Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised they don't have anything. To hear there are about a lot that. of strategies that talk about it, and there's some debate, and it goes into those, you know, some of these integrated questions, you know, if we had a commuter rail line, you know, and the question is, and, and we, we've had a lot of pushback that said, look, we've got the prices on that. I think city council just has to make a decision. You know, should we just put put commuter rail to bed and say that that's not something that we're going to be talking about anymore, or is it something that we should say we want to still pursue that because we still think there's value to it, even if the state doesn't think so? Well, I think our goal should be that leaving things status quo 
probably isn't great for Montpelier. That would be my sense. I mean, we we have a rail line that's used rarely. I mean, they're running a little bit of granite, and they run an occasional train out to deliver fuel to some of the fuel dealers. But it's an underutilized resource as far as I'm concerned. It has opportunities there that we could take advantage of. Is it going to cost money to take advantage of those? Yeah, but I think if we need to, if we're going to keep the rail line at all, it's going to need upgrades anyways. Or if we're going to get rid of it, that's not it, free either. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and and if we're talking about the rail line that would go to Barry as well, right? The, yeah. Yeah. It goes between Barry and where? It starts in Montpelier Junction, um, on the other side of the interstate, and it runs through downtown, and then it goes up on the other side of the river through Berlin, and it heads out to Barry City. It goes up past Spalding High School, and then starts to go uphill, and then it has a funky switchback, and it goes by the the uh, racetrack, and then it curls around and it hooks over and goes up to the Barry um, granite mines. It's originally a granite train, but they don't run granite anymore on it. Just tailings, occasionally. Just, yeah, just grout for filling in. Um, it could, well, yeah. Then a, a it's an expensive piece of infrastructure for running grout. Right. <laughs> <laughs> to, build, to build water, what and is it, water um, jetties. If the state decides to move some of the bridges, you know, not repair some of the bridges, then we'll, it will become even less useful. Is my understanding so? Yeah, but it'll run. It'll be running those same granite trains around the other side um, through Saban's pasture instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. maybe not a good plan. Anyway, so but I don't think we'll, we should try to tackle all of it in the plan. But I think we should have a goal. Yeah, of, we should mention it. Of yes. making it. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, yeah, one goal. In the, in the next eight years, we should make a decision on what it is. Um, and I think, you know, there are people who can make good arguments on both sides, and I'm one of the ones who's more than willing to stand up and make a good argument for why um, using, working on having commuter rail and some transit-oriented design has a lot of value. And okay. hopefully, you know, we can at least have the conversation at some point. So we should expect there to be a more fleshed out plan on the transit side to review not the next two meeting, meetings from the meeting after that. A meeting after, yes, they're going to, um, so unfortunately they meet the day after we do. So the next time we meet, I still won't have, I, I may have some draft strategies, but I won't have any final strategies. Yeah. In two, are you saying in two weeks? In four weeks. In four, four weeks. transportation yeah. in four weeks. Um, so you'll have some updates on the economic development. Yep, I can make the economic development changes. Yep. Um, we should, in the next couple of weeks, have another meeting on parks I'm working with, natural resources with the Conservation Commission should be in the next two weeks. They have some drafts, but it's been slow churning through them. Um, I think somebody else was working on one. Energy. Energy, thank you. So it's energy something. should be going next, what did we just say, next Tuesday? Yeah. A week from tomorrow to to MEAC. So we will see whether they are going to have something. Um, they have a full draft. It's just up to the, that was created by a subcommittee. We just need the committee to approve it. So it potentially could be ready for the next meeting. Um, my guess is the way these always work, people like to talk about these. They're real, really a lot of fun. So, But if we get them in advance, then we can at least look yeah. at them more fully. Yeah, I'll check with Kate to see if we can, can get those done. Um, and the last thing I will mention on our plan before we... I assume adjourn a couple minutes early is um, it looks like we will have a graduate intern working with us working in the planning office on the city plan this summer so my hope is that we will have somebody um, to really um, start helping me draft um, the plan chapters so that way we've got that first round through that people can start working and chewing on 
and marking up. So uh, we'll try to build those out in the, the GIS, ArcGIS hub, and that way we've got something that's there. And um, then we can integrate these into those and, you know, kind of see what we can build together. But um, I'm excited. I haven't had a graduate intern yet. This will be one of the first ones. So. From where? McGill. Oh, great. So. Last item on the agenda is adjournments. Anyone? Let's do it. <laughs> is that a motion? <laughs> is that a motion? John moves. John. <laughs> Wow, it is really. <laughs> anyone, anyone want to say? Okay. Second. There we go. Second. Now we're gone.